Hello once again. Let's continue with part five of our reading of Pilgrim's Progress. Then I saw in my dream that the interpreter again took Christian by the hand and led him to where there was a fire burning brightly against the wall. Now Christian was about to enjoy its warmth when he was gruffly pushed aside by an angry looking man with two pails of water. Out of my way, fool! The man set one bucket down and then tossed the contents of the other on the fire, shouting angrily, Out, cursed flame! Psh, out, I say! Psh, and out again! Take that! Next, he picked up his other bucket and tried again to douse the flames. But no matter how much water he cast upon the fire, he could do no more than make it choke and sputter for a moment. Then the flames would rise again higher and hotter than before. Oh, what's wrong with this miserable, worthless water, grumbled the man. Out, foul flame. Psh. Out, ah, out, cursed light. Psh. Out, 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 ha. What means this, queried the puzzled pilgrim? The fire you see is the work of grace burning in the heart of one who loves God. He who seeks to douse it is the devil. But it seems to me that in spite of his best efforts to put it out, the fire burns higher and hotter. Ah, yes, <laughs> chuckled the interpreter. And the reason for that thou shalt soon see. Whilst he goes off to refill his buckets, come around behind the wall with me. So he took him behind the wall where he saw a noble looking gentleman standing with a vessel of oil in his hand. Christian soon perceived that he was often pouring oil into a golden tube that passed through the wall and supplied the fire with fuel. Then Christian asked, What does this mean? This is Christ, whispered the interpreter reverently. He, by continually applying the oil of his grace, sustains the flame of love in our hearts. Ah, because of Christ's constant help, it matters not what trials the devil may pour in upon us. The oil of the Spirit floats above them all, and the flame of love burns brighter still. Aha, said Christian thankfully. A good lesson for me. And did you notice how our Lord stood behind the wall to maintain the fire? Ah, I wondered about that. Why so? To teach thee, dear pilgrim, that even when you cannot see him, Christ is always near. No matter what doubts may come or fears assail, your faith may burn brightly still. Then when I be tempted most, exclaimed Christian, I can rest assured that he who supplies the oil is still near at hand. Ah, he is the one that sticketh closer than a brother. And did you notice that his vessel is filled by golden tubes coming from two great olive trees? Ah, I can see how the ever-flowing stream renews his stores of oil. But of what are they symbols? These are the two witnesses spoken of by John. They are the ones which shall be slain and lie dead in the streets of Sodom and Egypt for three days. I'm afraid I don't understand, said Christian with a blank look on his face. Then the interpreter pointed to Christian's little book and said, Thou hast a copy of them in thy hand, the Testaments, old and new. Aye, they will provide thee with fuel enough to keep thy light shining through all eternity and rest assured dear christian that he who pours the oil will never suffer the waters of affliction to overflow thee to god be praises yes come he said reaching out to take him by the hand and so they left the fire burning brightly by the wall as they were going they could hear still the old devil shouting out cursed flame out 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 the pilgrim was then led out to a beautiful landscaped estate surrounding a mighty and stately palace. It was built of precious stones most lovely to behold, and atop its walls were turrets and, and parapets and mighty engines of war. Around it there was a moat with a drawbridge leading to a large heavily guarded gate of bronze. Walking upon its walls were certain youth all clothed in gold, and it seemed to Christian that they must be the happiest people he had ever seen. Looking in through the great bronze gate, Christian saw broad streets, marketplaces, 
lovely hanging gardens, and children laughing with their families and pets. At the sight of these marvels, he was greatly delighted and asked eagerly, May we go in here? Ah, someday, if thou art faithful unto death, come. Then the interpreter took him and led him nearer to the gate of the palace. And behold, at the drawbridge, there stood a great company of schoolmen and scholars, all greatly desirous of going in, but daring not to take action. Drawing closer, Christian heard two of them conversing as they tried to muster up enough courage to make a move. Said the first, Well, aren't you going in, dear professor? To this the second bowed low, swept his four-cornered cap gracefully toward the guarded gate, and answered, Not just now, lad. After you. Not at all. Age before beauty, you. Ah, to the contrary, young man. Tis fools rush in. Near the side of the moat was a table with a book, a pen, and a writer's inkhorn. Sitting at it was a dignified person whom I assumed to be some sort of scribe or notary. Upon seeing him, Christian asked, What is the purpose of this gentleman? His work it is to take down the names of all those who have the courage to enter in. Ah, after what seemed to be forever, the notary drummed his fingers impatiently on the table and called out, Come, come, come! Is there not one man among you with enough faith to take the kingdom of heaven by violence? In response to this challenge, there was total silence and downcast eyes. After a few moments, Christian remarked, No answer? Ah, uh, none. Do they not desire the kingdom? Ah, with all their hearts, or at least so they tell us. Then why do they wait? Then the interpreter pointed into the city and said, Look, look past the drawbridge. So Christian looked therein and saw many knights in shining armor guarding the gate. These were armed to the teeth with lances, spears, swords, daggers, maces, clubs, and shields. Moreover, there were catapults, trebuchets, and other great machines of war upon the walls. There were also many battle chariots drawn by matched teams of mighty black stallions. Christian noticed that the warriors were all on the alert. Yea, so much that if one of the scholars so much as looked at the gates with longing eyes, the dark knights would best bestir themselves, and the anxious stallions would paw sparks off the cobblestone with a whinny of eager anticipation. Then was Christian confused and asked, My, what are, what are all these fierce warriors about? Answered the interpreter, Their work is to defend the castle from any who would enter in. They are commanded not to yield admittance to en at any low price. Then was Christian near to tears, because so far as he could tell, there was no one with enough strength or courage to enter in. Then he once again chanced to overhear the same two schoolmen conversing as before. The elder of the two, royally attired in his cap and gown, stood, hands on his hips, glaring with furrowed brow at the guarded gate. His younger companion, after waiting in vain for his professor to lead the way, finally turned contemptuously and sneered, Well, aren't you going in? To this his instructor answered dryly, Oh, oh no, lad. Twas you were here first. Courtesy dictates that I should follow after you. Not at all, snapped the youth. Age before beauty, you know. To the contrary, countered the second dryly. Tis fools rush in, replied the younger sarcastically. You said that last time, to which the older quipped arrogantly. S so did you. At last it became obvious that these men, along with multitudes of the same ilk, were hanging back for fear of the armed men at the gate. Just when Christian was beginning to despair, he saw a young man of no apparent distinction marching bravely to the fore. He had a very determined look, and coming directly to the notary's table, said boldly, I choose to believe the words in my little book, sir. Therefore, set down my name, for I would enter in. And what be thy name? asked the notary. Belief be the name, sir. Belief. And what do you believe, good fellow? challenged the writer. In the promises of he who has invited me to enter in. Which promises, good sir? The one that saith, there shall no man be able to stand before thee. The man answered, Also another which saith that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Ah, weapons well chosen. Your name be writ down, Mr. Belief. Therefore, have on, and God be with thee. 
Now when the armed men at the gate saw that someone was actually putting down his name, they began to bestir themselves and to boast loudly of what they would do to him. And I must inform you that these were not idle threats, for they that made them were no ordinary soldiers, nigh but rather giants conscripted in mass from the town of Gath. The swarthy commander spoke first, saying to one of his heavily bemuscled companions, Hey, 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 look, see, mate. What? asked the second, looking up from shining his armor to espy Mr. Belief, signing his name with a flourish. Aha! So a fool has come to engage us in battle, has he? Good, growled the first, gingerly testing the razor-sharp edge of his sword with his nail. My blade has been too long thirsting for blood. I snarled the second, testing the sharp points on his mace, and the nails on my club have grown rusty. Come, fool! Now Mr. Belief completely ignored the swaggering giants and the ferocious threatenings, went straight to the armory to dress for battle. That in Christian, fearing for his safety, asked, Will he battle them all alone? Only to the eye of appearance, said the interpreter calmly. But look how many there are, and how huge, and see how deadly their weapons and fierce their faces. <laughs> Chuckled the interpreter merrily. They are nothing but paper giants, lad. Paper giants who hope never to win a battle. What do you mean? Watch, just watch and see. So Christian beheld as the man put on his head the helmet of salvation, fashioned about his loins the belt of truth, and strapped over his chest the breastplate of righteousness. On his feet he buckled the swift sandals of the preparation of the gospel of peace, which would enable him to dart among his enemies quick as a ray of light. Then, taking up his faithful shield, which was impervious to fiery darts, and the sharp two-edged sword, which cuts quickly to the very bone and marrow, he stood full abreast at the drawbridge. On guard, he shouted. Then he was off in a rush against the armed men at the door. Stop him, cried the captain. Get him, shouted his lieutenant grimly. Off with his head, cried one of the giants as he raised a huge headsman's axe. Organize men, shouted the captain as they began to scatter in confusion. Bring forth reinforcements, screamed the lieutenant as his weapon went skittering along atop the stone pavement. More troops, stop him, commanded the captain as he saw his men surrendering ground. Watching as more warriors rushed to join the melee, Christian grew more fearful than ever and cried out, He has no chance. Amused at his alarm, the interpreter only smiled calmly and said, The battle is not over. Watch on. The men at the gate laid upon belief with deadly force, but the man, not at all discouraged, fell to cutting and hacking most fiercely, crying out, You shall not stop me with your paper swords and mache masks. Take that. Oh, groaned one wounded giant. Help, cried another. Send four legions. Then belief seized upon his advantage and pushed forward with all boldness, saying, Nor shall I fall back, though you call forth a multitude more vicious than you. Back, I say. Ha! Ah, stop, begged one of the giants. Nay, but fall back more yet, he commanded with a swish hack of his two-edged sword. Now by this time, the giants and their reinforcements had begun to retreat in complete disarray. Here and there and everywhere, weapons of every sort lay scattered on the ground. One giant tripped over his own feet and became a stumbling block for three more who landed on their heads. Seeing the tide turn in his favor, Mr. Belief gathered up his up yet more courage and shouted, Run, feeble cowards! Run for your lives! Take that! Ha! And that! No! blubbered one of the giants piteously. Have mercy! To this belief only attacked the more fiercely, saying, There be no mercy for such lying impostors as you. Ha! Then the captain himself cried out, saying, Pity! We will be your slaves! Only have pity! At this belief staunched the unquenchable fury of his attack and commanded them to throw down their weapons. This they gladly did with a great clatter, all the while trembling with fear. Then he pointed the way to the dungeon to which they eagerly marched with hands raised high above their heads. Entering the gloomy dungeon with obvious relief, they locked the door behind themselves and gladly gave him the key. All the while, they kept up a constant whimpering, saying, Mercy, gentle knight, we were only doing our job, have mercy. 
Then amidst cheering from they that were within, Belief tossed the key into the moat and marched forward into the palace as he drew near the prize of his high calling. He heard pleasant words from those that walked upon the top of the walls. One said joyfully, Come in, come in, eternal glory thou shalt win. Another said, Come in, enter into the glory of thy Lord, come in. Suddenly Christian clapped his hands with joy and exclaimed, Say, I think I know the meaning of the one. Oh, said the interpreter. Yes, for look, there are neither dead nor wounded, nor is there any blood on the ground, but there are masks scattered hither and yon. Those fellows with such fierce faces and shining swords were only actors in a play. <laughs> yes, 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 chuckled the interpreter merrily. But they are only seen to be such by the eye of faith. To the faithless, tis a different tale. Listen to those two professors over there. So Christian turned to hear two doctors of theology commenting on recent events. Said the first to his companion with a genteel bow and a gesture toward the drawbridge. After you, good sir. Oh no, demurred the second. I have been teaching here only a few years. Common courtesy demands that I give way to seniority, dear doctor. Why do you quake in fear, lad? Yon brave man hacked his way through easily enough. Aye, but did you see his armor? I have none such to protect my innards. Well, does it look like I do? Then do we stand here forever, dear colleague, ever hoping and desiring to enter in, but never coming to the realization of it? The time is not right, that's all, the wise one declared sagaciously. We must wait for the promise of the latter rain, which will fit us up for the battle. Hmm, yes, I believe so too, said his colleague with a wistful glance toward the heavens. But as yet I see nary a cloud in the sky. Hmm, nor I, said the elder, scanning skillfully through a periodical. And looking here in the church paper, I see not so much as a forecast of clouds, let alone rain. Hmm puzzled his colleague. Strange that this illiterate and gullible underlying was able to hack his way through before us. I added his indignant companion, and that without one class in the use of the sharp two-edged sword? Whilst we are veritably experts in its use, grumbled the first. Indeed, in fact, I went to an outside university to obtain my degree in swordsmanship. Ah, did you now? said his companion, feigning disinterest. Well, hey, <laughs> so did I. In fact, I am licensed by the state to use my sword. How this blustering commoner hacked his way through is a complete mystery to me. Oh, beginner's luck, no doubt, surmised the second. Or perhaps brute strength, groused the first. I wonder if we should turn him in for using his sword without a license. Say now, that may might not be a bad idea. Well, whilst we're waiting for the clouds to form, shall we have a duel? Yes, a splendid idea, agreed the first eagerly. Twill give us something to do and keep our swords sharp besides. On guard, on guard, said the second, drawing his foil. So they earnestly began their oft-practiced and skillfully choreographed duel. Then Christian turned to the interpreter and said, They are afraid. Yes, but the defenders are not real. To those who will not take God at his word and move forward, said the interpreter sadly, the warriors are more real than you can imagine. Tis a mystery, this faith business, said Christian, shaking his head. To this the interpreter nodded in agreement, saying, Only, yes. But now, said Christian, looking longingly at the pathway to the celestial city, I am ready to be on my way. May I go now? Nay, nay, stay, said the interpreter with upraised hand. Stay until I have showed thee a few things more. After that, thou shalt go on thy way. So he took him by the hand again and led him into a very dark and dismal room, where there sat a man entombed in an iron cage, looking sympathetically upon him. Christian saw that he seemed very, very sad. He sat with his eyes looking down to the ground, and as he wrung his hands together, he sighed as if his heart would break. What means this? asked Christian with an aching heart. Why is this man locked in this iron cage? And why does his heart break so? Ask him. He will tell thee. So Christian stepped over to the cage, knelt down, and pulling his face against the bars, asked gently, Sir, 
Why do you weep and mourn so sadly? At this, the man sighed deeply and with downcast eyes said, Because I am utterly changed from that what I once was, and what were you once? Oh, I was once in my youth, the same as you, a fair and flourishing professor of religion, he answered sadly. And what are you now? I am now a man of despair and am shut up in it. As verily as I am shut up in this iron cage, I cannot get out. Oh, now I cannot, he cried bitterly. But how did you come into this sad condition? Christian asked gently. To this question, the man shuddered and then moaned. I stopped praying. I stopped off to watch and be sober. I laid the reins of reason upon the neck of my lusts. I sinned against the light of the word and the goodness of God. I have grieved the spirit and he has gone from me. I dallied with the devil and he has taken me. Christian stood with sympathetic tears in his eyes and turning to the interpreter asked, Dear interpreter, is there no hope for such a man as this? To this question, the interpreter could only gaze sadly toward the prisoner and say, Ask him. Then Christian turned back to the cage and kneeling before him again said, Is there no hope, sir? Must you forever be kept in this iron cage of despair? No, groaned he. No hope. No hope at all. But Christian, unwilling to let him surrender his soul, said, Why not? The Son of the Blessed is very pitiful. He can yet forgive. Not me, cried the man. He cannot forgive me. Still pressing his case, Christian said again, But he can. No, he cannot. Why not? Because I cannot repent, cried he in deepest anguish. I have crucified him to myself afresh. I, I have despised his person. I have despised his righteousness. I, I have counted his blood an unholy thing. I have done despite to the spirit of grace. Therefore, I have shut myself out of all the promises. And there now remains to me nothing but threatenings, dreadful threatenings, fearful threatenings of certain judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour me as an adversary. Good sir, exclaimed Christian. For what price did you sell yourself into this condition? For the same price that buys many a young man, he moaned. And what price was that? Then the man began to tremble, saying, It was for the lusts, the pleasures, the profits of this world, in the enjoyment of which I promised myself much delight. But now they are gone, and the guilt of every one of those things comes back to haunt me, and to bite me, and to gnaw me like a burning worm. Then was Christian amazed and turned to, turning to the interpreter said, He is the same as the child passion. Ah, answered the interpreter, nodding sadly. Then Christian turned back to the cage and implored the man saying, But sir, cannot, can you not now repent and turn? No, he groaned. I told you that I cannot. God will not be trifled with. Time after time I told him to leave me alone and he has finally obeyed me. He has left me. I have so long refused to listen that now he refuses to speak. I cannot find repentance. Yea, even in his word, I find no encouragement to believe. I have shut myself up in this iron cage of disbelief, and now all the men in the world cannot let me out. O oh, eternity, eternity, how can I bear the loss of eternity? Then the man turned away from his erstwhile helper and continued to moan softly to himself. The interpreter gently raised trembling. Christian to his feet, saying soberly, Let this man's misery be remembered by thee, and be an everlasting caution to thee. It shall, said Christian, glancing back at the cage. But pray tell, good sir, why has God shut him up in this iron cage? Then the interpreter shook his head and said, Nay, tis not God who hath shut him up thus. Then who? Tis Satan, who be the builder of cages, answered the interpreter eyes flashing in anger. God hath revealed himself as one who came to set the captives free. Then why may he not set this man free? Because sin hath blinded his eyes to the mercy of God. He cannot believe that God can forgive him. And what man cannot believe, God cannot achieve. Then if this man were somehow able to believe, could he, could he yet be free? Yes, 
Do tell, are there many that be in such a state as his? Yes, verily. There be multitudes who believe their sins to be so great that God cannot forgive them. They thus judge their sins to be greater than the power of God. Then what I have read is true. According to your belief, so shall it be unto you. Ah, agreed the interpreter. Sin hath so badly withered the arm of this man's faith that it cannot reach forth to grasp God's mercy. But did he not know this would happen? Nay, explained the teacher. He verily thought that he could lead a life of sinful pleasure and then turn to God at his good convenience. But when the pleasures of sin were past and he tried to exercise his faith, he found it tightly encoiled by the steel chains of his habits and lusts. Then I pray God to help me watch and be sober that I may shun the cause of this man's misery. But sir, is it not yet time to put me upon my way? Nay, said the interpreter. Tarry yet a little longer until I show thee one thing more. And then shalt thou go on thy way. So he took Christian by the hand again and led him into a chamber where there was one rising out of bed. And as he put on his ra his raisement, he shuddered and trembled and cried out, Ah! Then was Christian startled and turning to his mentor asked, Dear teacher, what makes this man tremble and cry out so? Then said the interpreter to the man, Dreamer, tell this pre pilgrim why thou didst cry out so. We'll continue with the story tomorrow.